It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the member for Kiewetanong. Miigwech, uh, Speaker. Uh, today, uh, Speaker, uh, the Chiefs of Ontario are launching a lawsuit against Ontario and Canada for failing to provide First Nations with equal access to policing services as under Ontarians. In First Nations across Ontario, we have communities in crisis. We have deaths every day, and we have communities being grossly underpoliced and underserviced. Will Ontario ensure First Nations have su sufficient uh, resources and me mechanisms to uphold our laws? To apply for the government, the Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. As this matter is before the court, it would be inappropriate for me to comment any further. Again, it would be inappropriate to comment further at this time. Supplementary question. Back to the member for Kiwetna. Speaker, uh, April 1st, on April 1st, this government sent a clear message that community safety does not matter in First Nations. They had five years to make sure that when they changed their uh, policing act, it would not discriminate against First Nations. Speaker, uh, I ask again, how does this government plan to keep our communities safe and ensure First Nation laws are enforced throughout the province? The Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. As this matter is subject now to litigation, it is inappropriate to comment any further. Again, it would be inappropriate to comment any further at this time. Order. Final supplementary. In a press conference today, uh, that, uh, the regional chief of Ontario said, "We don't have to go to court. Yes. It's right. up to, for this government to come to the table and say, include us in the process." You know, uh, Speaker, uh, being able to enforce First Nation laws on reserve will allow. First Nations police forces to keep drug dealers at bay using trespassing laws. But it also, Speaker, it can also help non-dangerous offenders break free from the destructive cycle and reintegrate into the community. Speaker, uh, the government can actually fix this matter today. Will Ontario passed a simple regulation under the CSPA, Question. making enforcement of First Nation laws mandatory. The Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. As a statement of claim has been issued, the matter is now before the courts. It's inappropriate to comment further. Mr. Speaker, it would be inappropriate to comment any further. Order. Order. The next question, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Under its agreement with the federal government, this government promised to build ne nearly 20,000 new affordable homes over 10 years, but six years later, they've barely managed to build 1,000. You've fallen so far behind that the federal government is punishing you and refusing to hand over affordable housing funding to this government. Whatever you're doing is not working. Order. So my question is to the to Premier. What is this government Order. going to do differently to ensure we build the tens of thousands of affordable homes that Ontario needs and get the funding that we are owed? Order. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you very much, Speaker. As I uh, said to the, uh, the member yesterday and today earlier in committee, uh, we've actually, uh, through our partners uh, and through our service managers, built 11,000 of the 19,000 homes that we were asked uh, to build. Uh, uh, and, 
We were asked to build, I think it was 26,000, rehabilitate, renovate, and repair 26,000. We've actually done 123,000 units, Mr. Speaker. So by any measure, it is, a, a, it is a, a, a smashing success for both the province of Ontario, our municipal partners, our service managers. Uh, speaker, nobody is being left without funding because the province of Ontario is paying the federal government's bills because we want to ensure that the most vulnerable get the housing help that they need. So we are paying the federal government's bills, and eventually, hopefully, they'll decide to pay the people of the province of Ontario back. But if they don't, we'll still be there for Response. the people of the province of Ontario. Supplementary question, Member for University Back to the Minister. In fact, the province has cut funding to municipal housing and homelessness programs. AMO estimates municipalities are on track to lose $2 billion over 10 years because this province has banned them from collecting fees to help pay for homelessness programs. At a time when shelters are full and cities and towns have permanent encampments in parks and sidewalks, what is this government's plan? to ensure every person in Ontario who is homeless is provided with shelter and permanent housing. Order. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, a good question uh, by, the minute, uh, by the member opposite, Mr. Speaker. What I, what I did was increase funding for homelessness uh, and prevention programs by 28 per cent in the member's riding, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and then and then I actually didn't stop there. This government, this caucus, uh, with the Minister of Finance's help and, and progressive conservatives on both sides of the House, decided that we had to do even more. And that is why, in ridings across the province, we have increased funding to the highest level ever. But, Mr. Speaker, it goes even further than that. It's the work that the Minister of Mental Health and Addictions is doing. It is the work that we're doing to bring jobs and opportunity back to the province of Ontario, Mr. <coughs> Speaker. We're building communities, whole communities, Mr. Speaker, that are not only affordable housing, attainable housing, all types of housing. We're building more schools, we're building more bridges, and we're doing this all in the context of having inherited a province Spons. that was on the brink of bankruptcy, that had an infrastructure deficit Mr. Speaker, whose affordable housing stock hadn't been renovated in over 15 years, we're getting the job done for the people of the province of Ontario. Order. Final supplementary. Uh, back to the minister. The federal government introduced a $5 billion housing infrastructure fund in April with conditions. Ontario must pass policies like making full plexes as of right to access this, yet, access this money. Yet the province's latest housing bill doesn't address this crucial requirement. My question is to the minister. Can this government fix the bill, allow full plexes as of right, and ensure we get the infrastructure funding we're eligible for? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Context. The federal government is going to spend $5 billion across the entire country, from sea to sea to sea, on infrastructure. We're spending $3 billion just in the province of Ontario to get sewer and water and roads built across the province of Ontario. And then we're going a step further. We're spending, what is it, $2 billion to build more schools uh, across the province of Ontario? Because when you build that, you build homes, you need schools. And then you know what else we're doing? We're building transit and transportation, and we're building new, new uh, automotive uh, uh, manufacturing capacity, so 700,000 jobs, because the people who are coming to work in the province of Ontario need to be able to get to work. They need the housing, Mr. Speaker. The federal government is right now putting provinces, uh, Order. trying to hold provinces hostage. There's not Response. one province. Not one province across the entire federation that supports what the federal government is doing right now, only the Ontario NDP. The member for Hamilton Mountain will come to order. The member for Brampton North will come to order. The next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Through you to the Premier. Recently, we obtained government records that showed just two days after Shakir Ramtula attended the Premier da Premier's daughter's wedding, Ministry staffers were looking for ways to open up Mr. Remtula's Greenbelt property in Nobleton for development. Mr. Remtula attended the wedding on September 27, 2022. By September 29, this had been deemed a priority project. Who deemed development of Mr. Remtula's property to be a priority project and why? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. In my community, uh, it was the mayor of both Markham and Stovall 
who deemed that those pro pro projects were a priority and asked the province of Ontario to move forward with ministerial zoning orders so that we could build more homes. Uh, Mr. Speaker, that is who made it a priority. Uh, we want to build more homes. Now, you know what the stumbling block is, colleagues, to building more homes across York Region? It is the infrastructure deficit that we inherited from the Liberals when they were in power for 15 years. Now, now the federal Liberal government, the federal Liberal government is providing Toronto with a billion dollars, I think it is, to build 2,000 homes. A billion dollars to build 2,000 homes. The investments that we are making in infrastructure will unleash thousands of homes Response. across your region, Mr. Speaker. Thousands of homes to help support the thousands of people who will be working in the province of Ontario. More work to be done, but we'll get the job done. Supplementary question. It had nothing to do with my question, Speaker. On the day the changes to the Greenbelt were announced, the Minister's Chief of Staff, Ryan Amato, asked Ministry staffers to confirm that Mr. Remtula's Nobleton property in the Greenbelt could be developed. Mr. Amato told staffers, quote, P.O. asked me for a picture to make sure it's captured, unquote. Ministry staffers responded Order. with assurances that changes to York's official plan would do just that. Who in the Premier's office wanted to make sure that the Nobleton property belonging to the Premier's friend was captured in the changes to the Greenbelt and why? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. It's a news flash to the member opposite. Uh, <laughs> Nobleton and King are actually in York Region, and York Region is suffering from an infrastructure deficit. Yes. York Region was also suffering from a, a school school deficit until this Minister uh, of Education came on board. Because what we're doing is building communities. Now, as, this is what Order. they do, right? They make enemies out of everybody who wants to move the province forward. So if you build a home, you're an enemy. If you're if you're a manufacturer, Order. You're, you're an enemy, right? If you drive a bus and want to buy a home, you got to be an enemy as well. They are all about making people enemies. What we are about is fixing the devastating damage that we inherited from the Liberal and NDP coalition government in the province of Ontario that left us with an infrastructure deficit, which left us the most indebted sub-sovereign government in the world, left us with the most highly regulated province Spons. in the world. Jobs were fleeing the province. We are working every single day to repair the damage. The job is not done, Speaker. The job is not done, and that's why we are going to double down to work even harder to continue the economic progress in Ontario. Thank you. Next question, the member for Simcoe Gray. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. The excitement from Honda's historic announcement on April 25th continues to grow. Throughout the Alliston area and throughout Ontario's automotive sector, from Windsor to Loyalist Township, enthusiasm is building. Honda's workers are proud, their suppliers are confident, and our entire EV ecosystem is supercharged for success. Speaker, Ontario's auto and manufacturing sectors are winning again and thriving again under this government. What a contrast from the industrial graveyard the Liberals left behind after 15 years of lost opportunity. 300,000 manufacturing jobs were lost under their watch. Speaker, can the minister please update the House on how Honda's investment will position Ontario's economy for the long term? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. April 25th was an historic day for Ontario, and quite frankly, for all of Canada. Honda announced a $15 billion investment right here in Ontario to build Canada's first comprehensive electric vehicle supply chain. Now, Honda will build an innovative EV assembly plant in Alliston. They'll also build a standalone battery manufacturing plant in Alliston. 4,200 jobs retained, 1,000 new jobs just on those sites. And to complete their supply chain, they'll build a cathode plant through a joint venture with Korea's POSCO. And they'll build a separator plant in a joint venture with Japan's Asahi Kosei. Now, those two announcements are coming in the very near future, the coming days and weeks, which will add a significant amount of employees here in Ontario. Their investment reaffirms that Ontario is the EV powerhouse. Supplementary question. 
Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his answer. I was at the announcement on April 25th, and you could feel the electricity in the air, and that was fitting because they're going to build electric vehicles and electric batteries. Honda's investment proves that our government's targeted and responsible economic plan is working. Under the previous government, 300,000 manufacturing jobs fled the province as hydro rates soared, red tape grew, and taxes rose. Speaker, countless uh, headlines over the last 15 years uh, told of companies packing their bags and leaving Ontario. But now we are reading headlines repeatedly and daily, almost weekly, about companies investing billions to move their operations to our province. Speaker, can the minister tell us about the state of Ontario's automotive sector today in comparison to where it was just six short years ago? And to respond, the Premier. The minister was kind enough to loan me this one question, so thank you, Minister. You know, as the minister was saying, $15 billion investment with Honda, another massive investment, multi-billion dollar investment we're announcing next, uh, next week, so by all means, show up. Around the world, around the world, when the minister was in Germany, Order. got off the plane, went in the terminal, took a picture of the big Ontario sign. Another person got off in LA, walked out in the terminal, it was all Ontario. The world is talking about Ontario. The world knows that Ontario is open for business. We've seen over $43 billion of investment in the EV sector, and as Bloomberg said, Canada, which should really be Ontario, is now the number one destination for EV assembly, EV battery production. We're going to continue Bonds. telling the world that Ontario is open for business, no matter if it's a $20 billion investment through the tech sector, $3 billion through the life sciences, more manufacturing jobs. Thank you. Thank you. The member for Hamilton Mountain will come to order. The next question. The member for Nickel Belt. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And I want to wish the hundreds of thousands of nurses in Ontario a happy nursing week. Yeah. 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 Including Nurse Diane Martin, CEO of WeRPN, and Karen McKay Eden, VP of ONA. They're here today, Speaker, because our health care system is in disarray with no relief in sight. Patients from sick babies to people needing palliative care face long wait time in emergency room and overcrowded hospital. Minister, it does not have to be that way. This is not the new normal. BC is implementing mandatory nurse-to-patient ratio. Will the minister commit to improving patient outcomes and nurses' retention and bring nurse-to-patient ratios in Ontario? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, yesterday when the Premier and Minister Dunlop and I were at TMU to celebrate and mark the uh, beginning of Nursing Week, I spoke to a nurse. I spoke to a nurse who trained and graduated under Bob Ray's NDP government. You know what she told me? She told me that only three nurses in her graduating class stayed in Ontario because there were no jobs. The NDP government was actually firing nurses. Yes. I now look at the Liberal government of the day. Your previous leader, Kathleen Wynne, admitted and acknowledged in her exit interview with TVO that she, quote, wished she had invested more in the health care system. Well, Speaker, we're doing it. We're getting it done. We're training more nurses. We're retaining more nurses. We're bringing international nurses to Ontario who want to be here. We have two years running, had historic highs of internationally trained clinicians licensing Response. in the province of Ontario. We're getting it done. Ontario you lost 4,500 RN under this minister. They also lost 460 RPN under this minister. Yep. But let me tell you, Speaker, the state of California implemented nurses to patient ratio 25 years ago, and the number speaks for themselves. Better patient outcome, less nurses burnout. Two challenges that this Minister of Health and Premier continue to ignore as they rush forward with the for-profit delivery of our health care system. It doesn't have to be that way, Speaker. If the government is interested at all in improving Ontario's health care system, there's a very easy first step they can do. Put in place nurse-to-patient ratio. 
Will the minister do it? Members, will please take their seats. Minister of Health. Speaker, what we will do is continue to bring forward initiatives, policies, working with the College of Nurses of Ontario, directing them to quickly assess, review, and ultimately license internationally educated nurses. What has that change happened? What that means is we have, for two years running, over 17,000 new nurses practicing in the province of Ontario. When we expand a Learn and Stay program that actually encourages students who want to train as RNs in the province of Ontario, covering their tuition and their books, we have seen historic numbers of young nursing students applying for those programs. And last week, I was with Minister Piccini, and I sat down with nursing students who are participating in, a, in an extern program, and they told me how that extern program Bonds. that was brought in under Premier Ford has made them more confident, has made them a better nurse, and that's the kind of initiatives we will continue. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Kitchener, Conestoga. Thank you very much, Speaker, and my question is for the Minister of Energy. The federal Liberals continue to make life less affordable for Ontarians by hiking the carbon tax. Many families and businesses across Ontario cannot afford the skyrocketing prices for everyday essentials. Unfortunately, Speaker, the opposition NDP and the independent Liberals in this House are refusing to fight this devastating tax. Will those members, while those members want higher and higher prices and higher taxes, our government is working for the people and supporting them during this difficult time. Speaker, with summer quickly approaching, can the minister please explain how the carbon tax will continue to drive up costs for Ontarians? Minister of Energy. Speaker, thanks to the member uh, from Kitchener Conestoga for his question this morning. Uh, the carbon tax obviously is impacting the price of gasoline, but it's impacting the price of everything. I couldn't help but uh, picture the Harris family of seven as they load into their minivan and maybe head for a holiday this summer about the price that they're going to be paying at the pumps to fill that van, Mr. Speaker, at a buck sixty-five a litre or whatever it is today. That family of seven, which incidentally, when I think about it, if the Harris family was a caucus, they'd be almost the same size as the Liberal <laughs> caucus uh, here in the legislature. Um, but they can rest assured that they're getting 10.7 cents a litre break from Premier Ford and our government here in Ontario. But they're also not going to have to pay the tolls if they come visit me in eastern Ontario. The tolls are gone in eastern Ontario. <laughs> License plate sticker fees are gone, Mr. Speaker. You know, our government, this is the contrast between our government and the Queen of the Carbon Tax, Bonnie Crombie, and the federal Liberals. Spons. We're looking to save people money. They're making life more expensive. It's time for them to scrap that tax. <laughs> Supplementary question. Well, not, not only seven members, but probably higher approval ratings, too, Speaker. But, uh, you know, it, it, it's good to hear that, 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 that the minister is, is paying attention to what the people of Ontario are looking for. And, you know, it is truly unfair that the Liberals continue to punish Ontarians who are already struggling to pay their bills, make ends meet, and provide more for their families by trying, with the Liberals trying to hike taxes. And, Speaker, what's even more disturbing is that the Liberal members in this House, knowing how much Ontarians are suffering, still still refuse to rise up and do the right thing and tell their federal counterparts that this tax needs to go. It's unacceptable, Speaker. Our government will not stand for their silence and inaction. Our government will continue to fight and tell the federal government that this, tax, that this is a tax that Ontarians don't want and don't deserve. Speaker, can the minister please tell this House why the people of this province Question. cannot afford this disastrous carbon tax. Minister of Energy. And, uh, Speaker, it's, it's not just the Harris family from the Kitchener area that's feeling the, the pinch of the punishing uh, carbon tax, Mr. Speaker, Speaker. It's families right across Canada that are feeling uh, the pinch. And, and we knew that this was going to happen. Back in 2018, we fought uh, the federal government on the carbon tax. We ended the cap and trade here in Ontario and trying to make life more affordable. And I think, you know, as the NDP and the Liberals 
always look to increase taxes or make life more expensive for the people of Ontario. You know, we're trying to drive costs down through things like I mentioned earlier, the gas tax break, eliminating the license plate sticker fees, um, income tax breaks, uh, you know, ending the tolls, making one fare uh, for our transit operators a possibility, saving people up to $1,600 a year. You know, these are real, tangible Response. impacts on families like the Harris family of seven and other families right across Ontario. We're going to be there to help those families while Bonnie Crombie, the queen of the carbon tax, and Justin Trudeau continue to make life more expensive for them. The next question, the member for Toronto St. Paul. Thank you, Speaker. 2.3 million Ontarians currently have no access to family physicians. and my, my question is to the Premier. Good morning, Premier. Our communities are aging, including burnt-out physicians, and recruitment and retention of healthcare professionals is waning. The Ontario Medical Association refers to this as the perfect storm. They need support now to establish interprofessional team-based models of care. Right now, only 70 per cent of doctors have access to a team. Family doctors have said that access to an interprofessional team would help reduce their workload so they can see more patients. The fundamental basis of our health care system. But this government is moving at a glacial pace to approve new primary care teams. My question is to the Premier. Why won't this government act with the urgency that the primary case crisis requires? Thank you, Speaker. The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Oh, Speaker. Um, so I'm not sure where the member was in February, but we actually announced the largest expansion of multidisciplinary primary care teams in Ontario. And of course, last month with the budget, we announced another over $500 million to expand primary care and multidisciplinary teams. I am hearing from multiple communities that have said they have already recruited, hired, and start to bring online new patients with these multidisciplinary teams. We're hearing about it in Kingston. We're hearing about it in Palmerston. We know that this is happening across Ontario. I only wish that the member opposite would support our budget that increases again the opportunities for multidisciplinary team Response. expansion in the province of Ontario. Area. Thank you. Area. Mr. St. Paul's Kathleen Christie, a retired senior citizen from my St. Paul's community, is here today. And she's, quote, very distressed with this government's disinterest and incompetence in solving the family physician crisis in Ontario. I guess the minister didn't talk to Kathleen. She goes on to say, I want my tax dollars to be allocated to the part of the health system that affects me and every other citizen most access to family doctors. Enough is enough, Premier. Value the family physician and compensate them fairly. Kathleen is also very worried about this government's health care privatization scheme, as we all are here in this legislature. My question is back to the Premier. Good morning, Premier. Will the Premier tell Kathleen his plan to attract recruit and retain family doctors while also paying the health professionals properly and not scamming them the way he's done nurses. Thank you. I'm going to ask the member to withdraw the unparliamentary comment. Which word was that? Okay, just a second. It, I don't need any help from this side of the house. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask the member for Toronto St. Paul's to withdraw the unparliamentary comment. Withdraw. To reply, the Ministry of Health. So much sincerity there, Speaker. You know, I will say that, that we had last week residency students, medical students who were matched with their specialty, 100 per cent coverage now in the province of Ontario, which again is a historic high. We have residency physicians. Physicians who want to train as primary care doctors Order. who have been matched and are now working towards those goals. You know, I look at the when I speak to uh, the city of Brampton, when I see the expansions that we are happening, 
that we are doing with medical schools in Brampton and in Scarborough. Uh, it is incredible the amount of investments that we as a government have made to ensure that moving forward we are never in the position Us? that we were when we formed government, where Liberal and NDP governments continuously in ignored the health care system at the Member for Toronto St. Paul's will come to order. Member for Brampton North will come to order. The next question, the member for Kingston and the Islands. Mr. Speaker, my question today is about protecting us from contaminated groundwater. The Kingston and Area Real Estate Association is circulating a petition about this issue. After repeated questioning two weeks ago, the government has finally said yes to continuing free testing of well water, but it failed to commit to keeping the Public Health Ontario laboratories that do the testing. Why won't this government commit to protecting us from contaminated groundwater by continuing to keep open the regional public health laboratories in Peterborough, Aurelia, Hamilton, Kingston, Sault Ste. Marie, and Timmins? Minister of Health. <laughs> Speaker, uh, I have regularly and consistently reinforce the value and importance of well water testing in the province of Ontario. I grew up on a farm in rural Ontario. My riding is primarily served by well water. I absolutely understand the value and importance of having the well water testing available through our public Order. health units. We will continue to do that as we have for decades to come. But more importantly, we will also invest in Public Health I Ontario, like something that the member opposite under their leadership did not do. Here, here. Supplementary question. Uh, speaker, there's uh, potential for contaminated groundwater in Wilmot Township, where this government has told the region of Waterloo to assemble farmland for industrial use. Not only is that prime farmland at risk, across the road and downstream, you'll find a cabbage farm where they make St. Jacob's sauerkraut. You'll find a dairy farm where they also make award-winning mountain oat gouda cheese. In this region, if you need water, it has to be drawn from the underground aquifer. The Waterloo region is one of the largest groundwater users in Canada. Does this government realize that the aquifer must be protected? How can these valuable agri-food operations be protected from contaminated groundwater with all the secrecy and non-disclosure agreements around assembling Wilmot's prime agricultural land for industrial use? Remove the code of Start the clock. Order. Order. Minister can reply. Minister Phil. Uh, again, I will say it again because clearly there seems to be some misunderstanding. The public health system that we have continued to invest in as a government will continue to be there. We did it through a pandemic. We made sure that public health officials, our medical officers of health, and the critically important registered nurses and clinicians who work in the public health system will continue to be a very important part of our health care system. We understand the value of it, and I think respectfully the people of Lambton, Kent, Middlesex, and Milton understand the value and importance of it, which is why we are celebrating two new members. Nice Thank you very much. Okay. The next question, the member for Simcoe Gray. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade, although if the Premier wants to jump in, I'm good with that. <laughs> a little over a week ago, our province welcomed an historic generational investment in my riding of Simcoe Gray. And, Speaker, it is an investment that before we took office, no one would reasonably imagine have coming to Ontario. Economic development was at such a low priority for the previous Liberal government that no one could fathom global companies willingly choosing Ontario as a destination to invest and expand in. The Liberals' high tax policy chased out countless numbers of businesses and left our auto sector on the brink of collapse. 
Thankfully, under this government, Speaker, Ontario is in a much different place today. We have secured tens of billions of dollars in new investments in our auto sector and right across our economy. Speaker, can the minister please tell this House more about the Honda's generational investment in Ontario? And to reply, the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thank you, Speaker. Honda's $15 billion investment is the largest investment in Canadian auto history. Ontario has now attracted $43 billion in new auto and EV investments in the last four years. That is more than any U.S. state. Now, what does that tell you, Speaker? Think about where we were under the Liberals. High taxes, red tape that was out of control, everything the Liberals could possibly do to hurt business. We step in under Premier Ford, and what happens? Lower taxes, reduced red tape, lower electricity rates, $8 billion in lower cost of doing business every single year. That's what's bringing companies here into the province of Ontario. The lower cost of doing business has brought 700 thousand workers here into Ontario since we are elected. This is what's attracting businesses all Response. over the world. They look at Ontario as this beacon, this light that's happening here. They want to be part of it, and now we're at 43. Thank you very much. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his answer. Honda's investment indeed is a game-changer for this province. It will create good-paying jobs for my constituents in Allison and the surrounding region. It is a testament to the competitive advantage that Ontario now has in the automotive sector. Ontario's more than 100,000 auto workers are the best in the world. Automakers recognize this, and that is why they are doubling down in Ontario. They see an automotive ecosystem that has been revitalized over the last six years. It is now thriving and robust and leading in the world. They see a province that has everything they need, talent, low costs, an abundance of clean energy, and so much more, Speaker. That is why they are choosing Ontario. Speaker, can the minister tell us about what Honda's investment means for our automotive active system? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, think about when we were elected. Reuters, the news agency, they reported that there will be $300 billion invested in EV supply chain over the next few years. But the bad news was zero was intended in coming to Canada, and that means zero into Ontario. That's the climate. That's the climate that the Liberal government had developed. Not a dime was coming here. Now look at today. Bloomberg has announced that Canada, and as the Premier said, ostensibly Ontario, is now ranked number one in the world supply chain. Speaker, we went from zero to $43 billion. We went from zero, last place, to number one. That is what's happening. We came so close to seeing the end of our auto sector under Boss. that previous government. Our workers were almost permanently sidelined because of the legacy of the Liberals. So from day one, as I said, our approach was to lower the cost of doing business. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Thunder Bay, Superior North. Thank you, Speaker. Given the destructive effects of Bill 124, it is no surprise that senior health care workers have left their hospital positions and that even new nurses are being drawn into the nursing agency vortex, a situation that is pushing almost every hospital in Thunder Bay Superior North into massive debt. What is the government doing to attract nurses back into full-time positions and stop the flood of health care dollars going to shareholder profits? Minister of Health. Speaker, we've been supporting our health care partners the, uh, through our two budgets, both last year and this year. We have committed to increase annual operating dollars for hospitals by 4%. Those are two historic high years in terms of investments into our health care system. And specifically as it relates to how are we assisting on the health care resources, we're doing so many pieces, whether we talk about learn and stay. But I really want to talk about externs. You know, I made mention of Minister Pacini and I sitting down with some nursing students who are it 
externs right now working in the hospital sector. And I asked them, where are your pathways? Where are you going when you graduate? They said because of the extern program, they are more confident as students, they are better employees Spots. as registered nurses, they are excited to join the healthcare sector in the province of Ontario, and we are opening our arms to make sure that we make them welcome. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. The wage disparity between public and private health care wages is also impacting nurse practitioners in my region. The scope of practice of nurse practitioners has increased exponentially with no acknowledgement or financial recognition. The result is that nurse practitioners are leaving community clinics to set up fee-based for-profit practices. This is two-tier medicine. Right. When will the government address the wage gap identified in the Hay Report and bring nurse practitioner wages up to levels appropriate to their skills and responsibilities? Good Thank you, Speaker. The member opposite references scope of practice. Let's talk about some of the things that our government has been doing with our health care practitioners, specifically as it relates to scope of practice. Of course, we all are aware, because over 700,000 Ontarians have accessed it, a scope of practice change that happened with our pharmacies. That is a direct patient benefit and income that we have seen. Scope of practice just announced with midwives, ensuring that they can continue to serve their patients and the babies that they help deliver in the province of Ontario. Those announcements were just made very recently. Scope of practice changes for registered nurses and nurse practitioners. We are making sure that clinicians who work in our health care system in the province of Ontario are practicing to their highest level of education because we know it leads to better patient outcomes. Thank you, Speaker. The next question, the member for London Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. I met with the Toronto child care advocates and London child care providers, and they're very concerned about this government's lack of accountability and transparency in the implementation of the $10 a day child care system. It's astonishing that two years later, there's still looming questions. They want answers, and they want to know where the money is spent. Will the Premier commit to requesting the, to the Auditor General provide a full audit of the government's spending on the $10 a day child care program? Minister of Education. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Government of Ontario came in in 2018 inheriting the highest child care prices in Canada, roughly $50 to $60 a day, 500 per cent increase under the former Liberals, and it really was unacceptable. We priced parents out of the market. Mothers often had to make a choice of working or raising their kids, and that's a false choice for so many. And so we got to power. We rolled up our sleeves. We negotiated a better deal, and we now have cut fees by 50 per cent, saving at least $8,000 a child in this province. That's a meaningful action that puts money in the bank for working parents. We're also increasing spaces, 86,000 more to go. If the member opposite wants to be constructive in her advocacy for London families and, and operators, then stand with us. Stand up to the federal government for a deal that allows them to fund for profit childcare so that 30 per cent of the operators in London could receive the funding they deserve so that all parents receive affordable Response. and accessible childcare in the province of Ontario. Yeah. Supplementary question. Speaker, what advocates and stakeholders are asking about the financial spending on this program, and let's face it, the lack of trust in this government in the implementation of the $10 a day child care program is warranted. This government can't even publicly report on how many of the 41,000 child care spaces they've created since 2019, which, are, which ones are subsidized of that 41,000 under this national child care program. When the government doesn't provide financial records, it breeds speculation. Can the Premier tell the London child care advocates and providers who actually sit on the government's advisory group, and they haven't met since June, who is the government consulting with for the funding formula advice? Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Speaker. You know, I was proud to be in London with your mayor to announce 
over 9,000 spaces being committed for the people of London. This is an increase of spaces for working parents. They no longer have to wait on a wait list. The member opposite speaks about accountability. We are right now, because the province of Ontario had the fortitude to negotiate a midterm review, which allows technical officials by public servants between the Ministry of Finance and the federal government and the Ministry of Finance and the provincial government working through technical analysis of the numbers. Because what it will prove to the feds, and what I hope the member opposite will stand with this government in articulating to the federal government, is there's a delta, there's a gap, and we knew this when we signed the deal. And what we should be is united as a parliament to demand more funding and more flexibility from the feds so that we actually support all families and all kids in all regions of this province. Yeah, yeah. The next question, the member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Energy. The failed Liberal carbon tax is driving up the cost of everything, including basic necessities, and is punishing communities across the province, including my riding of Stormont, Dundas, and South Glengarry. Speaker, driving is the primary form of transportation for most residents in rural Ontario. The carbon tax has placed a heavy burden on my constituents, who now have to pay more for fuel, food, and heating. That's why our government has not stopped fighting against the carbon tax. We are fighting for the people of Ontario, Speaker. Speaker, can the minister explain how our government is reducing energy costs for the people of Ontario as we com combat the negative impacts of the carbon tax? Minister of Energy. Thanks to the member uh, from the Cornwall region for his question this morning. We're doing a lot here in Ontario to ensure that we're combating the punishing impact of the carbon tax on the people of Ontario, and that includes the gas tax break, eliminating uh, cons uh, uh, tolls in uh, eastern Ontario, also uh, ending the license plate sticker fees, ending that very costly and wasteful uh, drive clean program, which was just another scam, Mr. Speaker, ensuring we're bringing in one fare. But we're also investing in clean infrastructure for the future that's going to ensure we have the energy we need that's affordable, reliable, and clean. And a couple of weeks ago, I've mentioned a few times in the House, I was down at Sir Adam Beck talking about our billion dollar investments in refurbishing our hydroelectric facilities in Niagara. I'm really looking forward Spons. to joining the member from Cornwall a little bit later on this week, where we're going to be making a similar announcement in his riding, ensuring we've got clean energy for the people. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that great answer, and I can't wait to welcome you into Cornwall. It is encouraging to see our government continue to build on our clean energy advantage while keeping costs down for the people of Ontario. The Governor of the Bank of Canada stated that the carbon tax contributes 15 per cent each year to the upward pressure on inflation, and that scrapping the tax altogether would lower inflation. Speaker. It is clear that the carbon tax is not helping Ontario. It is hurting us. Our government must continue to deliver affordability by fighting the terrible Liberal carbon tax as we roll out real, practical solutions to make Ontario's electricity grid not just more affordable, but also cleaner and more reliable. Speaker. Can the minister please explain how our government is achieving our energy objectives without introducing a costly carbon tax? Minister of Energy. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. I referred to the uh, refurbishments that we're doing in our hydroelectric facilities across the province and look forward again. Uh, maybe he'll buy me a blizzard at his uh, family <laughs> restaurant when I'm in Cornwall uh, a little bit later on this week. But we're also refurbishing our nuclear facilities, and this is a tremendous story. And the world really is watching what's happening here in Ontario, not just in the evolution of our EV sector and EV battery sector, but in our nuclear sector. We're building the first small modular reactor in the Western world at Darlington. We're refurbishing the can-do reactors that we have, multi-billion dollar investments that aren't just coming in on time and on budget, they're coming in ahead of time, Mr. Speaker. We are building battery storage facilities, other non-emitting resources to make sure that our system is operating as efficiently as possible, investing in energy efficiency Spons. programs like the Peak Perks program and the ultra-low overnight rate for charging the EVs and cars of the future, Mr. Speaker. We have a plan, and it's working. It Thank you. Thank you. The next question, a member for Spadina. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On the weekend, I attended a, a Jane's Walk at Ontario Place, organized by Ontario Place for All, and it, we toured the incredibly beautiful, iconic parkland down at Ontario Place, where 190 bird species have been identified, many of them at risk, some of them on, on the verge of extinction. And this, the Premier saw that there was a problem with Ontario Place. He thought, you know what? 
No one is making money from that iconic parkland on the waterfront in Toronto. So he's giving it away to a European mega spa company that is now promoting an immersive wellness experience that allows people to pay money to connect with nature by watching videos of trees. Why is he spending 650 million tax dollars to cut down 800 real trees so that people can pay money to watch videos of trees? To apply the Minister of Infrastructure. This doesn't get Thank any you very here. much, Mr. Speaker. The member opposite mentioned an iconic space. I would not agree with that statement at all. Perhaps back in the 70s, when it was first built, it was an iconic space which families enjoyed. They do not enjoy this space anymore. Falling the apart. island is falling apart. It is flooding. In fact, Live Nation had to cancel its shows back in 2017 because of the flooding. But not to worry, Mr. Speaker, under the Premier's leadership, we're bringing Ontario Place back to life, and it will include 50 acres of public realm space, more trees, more vegetation, food and beverage, brand new Maria, uh, marina, science centre, wellness centre by Thermae, and a brand new Budweiser stage for families and all Ontarians to enjoy. Supplementary question. Okay, well, although the minister tried not to release it to the public, the documents show that 2.9 million Ontarians enjoyed Ontario Place in 2022. <laughs> On the weekend, there was also a James Walk at the Science Centre, and this, it's the Science Centre, the Ontario Science Centre was one of the first of three built in the world. They develop uh, exhibits that are used in science centres around the world, but. This government, and it's been shown by the Auditor General, the Auditor General has said that this government is going to be spending 500 million tax dollars to build a new science centre that's half the size, which is more than $300 billion more than rejuvenating the, the, the existing science centre. So my question is, why does this government, why are you disrespecting the people in Flemington Question. and Thorncliffe communities? Why are you disrespecting the students at Mark Garneau Collegiate? Why are you disrespecting the taxpayers of Ontario by wasting at least 300 million tax dollars to destroy Thank you. I'll remind the House that uh, they make their comments through the chair. Minister of Infrastructure can reply. Mr. Speaker, why is the member opposite disrespecting Ontarians? Exactly. By standing in the way of us building a new science exactly. centre that will be enjoyed for another 50 yeah, to 75 yeah. years. In fact, the member opposite, you know what he would like? He would like the science centre, like Ontario Place, to just fall apart so that it, it ends up being closed. But we will not do that because we believe in science education, as does the Minister of Education. Order. But again, Mr. Speaker, not to worry, under the Premier's leadership, we will have a brand new science centre with more exhibition space for families to enjoy and a brand new Ontario place. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Small Business. He's a great minister. Small businesses in the restaurant and food service industry are not only vital job creators, but they have an integral role in our economy and in our local communities. Our province would not be the same without restaurateurs who foster job growth, support local agriculture, and put Ontario's culinary scene on the international map. Here, here. That's why it is shameful that the federal government continues to strain all these small businesses with their costly carbon tax. Shame. Our government knows the carbon tax makes it more challenging for businesses to survive. And, Speaker, we won't Question. stop fighting until the federal Liberals finally scrap this tax. Here, here. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please share with the House what food service operators across Ontario are saying about Thank you. The Associate Minister of Small Business. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the great member from Newmarket, Aurora, for the question. Speaker, food entrepreneurs are core ingredients in the recipe for thriving local economies and strong communities we can all be very proud of. That's why I was thrilled to recently attend the Restaurants Canada 2024 trade show. And, Speaker, 
The message came through loud and clear. The federal carbon tax is taking a huge bite out of these businesses. I heard from the owners of a popular family diner who said their monthly natural gas bill for operating ovens, fryers and kitchen equipment has increased significantly over the past year because of this tax. Speaker, this is sadly just the tip of the iceberg. Across Ontario, restaurateurs, cafe owners Spots. and food truck operators are being threatened by escalating expenses on all fronts thanks to the federal carbon tax. I hope now the opposition will listen to their restaurateurs right across this province and tell the federal Thank you. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Associate Minister for her response. Here, here. The Liberal carbon tax is not only forcing our favourite restaurants to reduce their staff levels or raise prices on customers, but it is also squeezing every penny from the farmers and agricultural producers who supply these small businesses. Farmers across the province have been speaking Order. out against the federal carbon tax because it is raising their already high expenses and cutting into their bottom line. It is unacceptable for them to face additional tax burden from the Liberals, and it is unacceptable that the Liberal members in this House are content to see Ontario farmers and small businesses being taxed Question. more. Shame. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please explain why small and family-run farms as well as food producers, cannot afford this regressive carbon tax. Minister responsible for small business. Thank you, Speaker, and again to the great member for the question. Speaker, Ontario farmers, growers and food producers are the foundation of our economy and food supply chains. From the tender fruit orchards of Niagara to the innovative greenhouse operations around Leamington and the Holland Marsh, these multi-generational family businesses work tirelessly to feed us while sustaining good jobs. Speaker, the Liberals need to get out of their urban bubble and talk to the working people of Ontario. Imagine if you're a fifth-generation egg farmer. Thanks to the carbon tax, your natural gas heating costs have tripled, but your sales have not. That's money going out of your pocket instead of being reinvested into modernizing your operations and hiring more locals. So, Speaker, you can thank a Liberal the next time you pay more for a carton of eggs in your local grocery Response. store. This Premier and this government will continue to fight for Ontario's small businesses, and we're going to continue to call on the federal government to scrap the tax. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for London North Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Since this government opened the floodgates to profit-driven private health clinics, extra billing and add-ons are all too common. My constituent, Gerald, had a prescribed diagnostic procedure. Afterwards, he was told he had to pay to get a copy of his results. When he questioned it, he was offered a smaller fee to get them online instead of paper. Why is this Conservative government allowing extra billing to happen? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. As the member opposite knows, there are OHIP-covered funded services that we continue to expand and provide in the province of Ontario. But I want to talk specifically about those individuals who, under our changes, an expansion only in cataract surgeries, we have seen the wait times for cataracts in communities decreasing dramatically. Order. We specifically chose cataracts because it had some of the highest wait times in the province of Ontario. What does that mean? It means people who couldn't continue to drive, who couldn't work, who couldn't volunteer, who couldn't read a book to their grandchildren. By expanding cataract surgeries in four communities, an existing publicly unfunded OHIP-covered divisions, we have seen Response. a dramatic decrease in the wait times. We're going to continue to do that because that's what the people of okay. Stop the clock, please. <laughs> there are a lot of private conversations taking place in the chamber, such that the uh, cumulative volume is making it difficult for me to hear what's being said by the people who have the floor. So I would ask everyone to please quieten down. Thank you. 
start the clock. Supplementary question. Speaker, in listening to that answer from the, the minister, the only thing the minister has expanded in health care are extra billing and privatization. <laughs> Speaker, Gerald had the same procedure. Order. The very same procedure before this Conservative gov government allowed clinics to squeeze patients. And guess what? There was no fee. Did the government hear me? There was no fee. Now, this clinic offers membership plans for a monthly fee, a yearly plan, or a one-time record collection fee. All extra fees that are unethical and ought to be illegal. My question to the minister. There's an affordability crisis across this province. People are struggling to make ends meet. My question, will the Premier kill these fees or double down on this disastrous health care privatization agenda? Members, please take their seats. Minister of Health. Speaker, there you have it. You have an NDP party that believes undeniably that they cannot have Third any party. kind of innovation in innovation the province of Ontario. I'd like to give you a very specific example. Ontario invested $5 million in the Centre for Integrated and Advanced Medical Imaging for a 3,500-square-foot facility to harness cutting-edge innovation. Health Sciences and St. Joe's Healthcare Hamilton, who are partnering with Mohawk College and McMaster University to harness cutting-edge technology, their improved system, a partnership between private hospitals in, in, as well as uh, hospitals, colleges and universities, means that they have found MRIs that will enable Response. center staff to reduce scanning times by 50 per cent. That's the kind of innovation that our government will yeah. continue to fund because the people of Ontario deserve to have world Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning.